Welcome, I'm Ijoma Onyato. Tonight, Presidential Election Petitions Tribunal adjourns pre-trial hearing in petition by the PDP and its candidate, al Haji Atiko Abubakar, to July the 1st on the request of the petitioners. EFCC re-raised former Minister of State for the FCT, Jumoke Akinjide, and two other leaders of the People's Democratic Party over alleged 650 million Naira money laundering. Troops of one division, Nigerian Army, kill 61 suspected armed bandits, arrest others in separate operations launched in Kaduna, Kano, and Niger states. And U.S. Senate passes its own border aid bill after rejecting the version approved by the House of Representatives following outrage over photos of a drowned migrant father and daughter. Business news tonight, former non-interest lender, that's Nigeria's oil export to Europe, set for highest level in seven months following disruptions at the North Sea oil fields. On sports news tonight, Super Eagles of Nigeria become the first team to advance to the knockout stages of the 2019 Africa Cup of Nations after they defeated Guinea 1-0 in their second match. And from Abuja, INEC chairman commends commission staff for the performance in elections. Says Electoral Empire is the most improved pub public service institution in Nigeria since 1999. The Presidential Election Petitions Tribunal has adjourned the pre-trial hearing in the petition filed by the People's Democratic Party and its candidate Al-Haji Atiku Abubakar to July the 1st, 2019. The chairman of the panel, Justice Mohammed Garba, fixed the date following a request by the petitioner's lawyer, Mr. Chris Uche, for time to reply on a point of law to the APC's objection to their application. Atiku and the PDP had filed a fresh motion asking the tribunal to halt the delivery of its ruling in a motion on notice filed by the APC. The APC had on June the 11th, through its counsel, Latif Agbemi, prayed the tribunal to strike out Atiku's petition or, in the alternative, strike out several paragraphs. Well, as a matter of fact, we came prepared to start uh, what we call the scheduling of witnesses, uh, documents and taking specific dates for hearing uh, because as you all know this is a matter of utmost urgency. But incidentally uh, it's been adjourned to 1st of July so we'll come back here on 1st of July to continue. And secondly, you know there was a motion that was to be taken and um, we were only served with a counter affidavit by the other side just here in court and this has occasioned an adjournment. We all are very anxious to see that this matter is dealt with expeditiously and that was why we were pushing to ensure that uh, the other aspect of pre-hearing proceeded today. But the matter is adjourned to 1st of July and we shall be here to ensure that we go on. And still in the nation's capital, an FCT high court sitting in the Buari area of Abuja has voided the criminal charge brought against the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Bajabia Mila. The African People's Party and one Mr. Ansa Issa Mohammed had alleged at the Grade 1 area court in Abuja that Mr. Bajabia Mila led under oath or lied under oath while failing, filling INEC form CF001 to the effect that he was never convicted of any crime. The respondents had contended that the speaker was found guilty of professional misconduct by the State Bar of Georgia in the United States of America in 2007. Mr. Gbajabi Amela had, however, challenged the criminal proceedings instituted against him and applied for a judicial review at the FCT High Court. The presiding judge, Justice Othman Musa, in his judgment, quashed the criminal charge against the speaker on the ground that the lower court lacked jurisdiction to entertain and determine the matter. The judge further held that the allegation of disciplinary proceedings leveled against Mr. Bajabia Miller does not amount to any criminal conviction by a court of law. Meanwhile, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission has rearranged a former Minister of State for the Federal Capital Territory, Mrs. Jumoke Akinjide, and two People's Democratic Party leaders in Oyo State before a federal high court sitting in Lagos. Ms. Akinjide, Senator Ayo Adeshion, and Mrs. Olanrewaju Otiti were rearranged on a 650 million naira money laundering charge. At the proceedings today before Justice Chuku Jeku Aneke, 
counsel to the EFCC, Rotimi Oedekwo, told the court that the prosecution had amended the charge against the defendants. He asked the court to quash a previous charge made against them and substitute same with a fresh 24 count. Ms. Akinjide's counsel, Bolaji Ayorinde, then made an oral application for the court to allow his client to continue on the existing bail granted her by the previous court. The lawyers for the other defendants also made similar requests. But the EFCC prosecutor objected and instead asked the courts to impose fresh bail conditions that would secure the appearance of the defendants in court. In a short ruling, Justice Aineke dismissed his objections and granted the oral application of the defendants. Away from the courts now, reports from the United Nations Office on Drug and Crime says the rate of substance abuse in Nigeria has doubled within the last one year, with 14 million people said to have used drugs for non-medical purposes. The UN agency revealed this as it marks the 2019 International Day Against Drug Abuse in Abuja. The report also noted that those who abuse these substances are mainly between the ages of 15 and 64. Instituted in 1989, the United Nations has consistently marked the International Day Against Drug Abuse and Illicit Trafficking on June the 26th of every year. <laughs> the day is used to raise awareness on the dangers of drugs and substance abuse. Despite the several anti-drugs campaigns, however, the number of people using drugs and abusing other substances continue to rise globally. According to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, UNODC, an estimated 271 million people globally use drugs in 2017 alone. This figure represents 5.5% of the global population of people between the ages of 15 and 64. The report also reveals that an estimated 35 million people globally now suffer from drug use disorder. This number is 15% higher than 2016, which was estimated at 30 million. Back home in Nigeria, the number of those abusing substances have also risen. According to the United Nations, an estimated 14 million people use drugs in Nigeria. This represents 14.4% of Nigeria's population between the ages of 15 and 64. As Nigeria joins the rest of the world to mark the 2019 International Day Against Drug Abuse and Illicit Trafficking in Abuja, attention is fixed on what must be done to address this menace. Statistics are just not for the, uh, the making. They are brought out so that people or relevant bodies can act on them. In this instance, the government. The government sees the large amount of citizens that are victims. It will lead to more funds for uh, the staffing, more funds for uh, supply reduction, and all the others. That is why, Mr. President, uh, besides Senator Pasteda, has allowed us to recruit 15 immediately. The use of cannabis, tramadol and cough syrups for non-medical purposes top the list of drugs and substances mostly abused in Nigeria. To address the situation, the federal government prohibited across-the-counter sale of some drugs including tramadol, as well as set up the presidential task force on drug abuse in 2018. Care of. Now let's get more on the issues surrounding drug abuse. I'm now being joined on the news at 10 by the Director General of the Christ Against Drug Abuse Ministry, Dr. Dokma Dedechi. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you for uh, bringing me. Now, how worried are you about the rising statistics? Mm, very worried. Uh, over the years, even from field experiences of what we've seen, I am worried because you will notice that the age of use is now coming down. It's dropping. Yeah. It's dropping. It used to be before we say 25 to whatever, but now it's come to 16. But I can tell you for free that we can find young people as young as 10 doing drugs. And this is not in small numbers. But is there anything you've identified as the reason why even younger children are now being drawn into substance abuse in your experience? I, I think what I would say is the availability. And the, the easy availability and accessibility to these drugs. One and also the level of decadence in the society, and then the value drop, and then the fact that nothing and anything goes on, mm -hmm. and also 
the, the, the fact that too many young people have too much time on their hands, that they can double the thing, and the sense of experimentation is there, and also the value of technology, saying, oh, not to worry, you can do this, it's not bad, and uh, the rest of it. Uh, and I think the lack of role modeling for these young people. Do you think agencies have done all they can in terms of public awareness? Because, you know, years ago you mm. had this whole drug abuse campaign. Mm. Now you see more of it in little meetings, in, in conferences. Mm. I don't know. Have they done enough to... No, I, I, I would not say we, we, they've done enough, or rather we've done enough. It's not only the agencies, because to be quite honest with you, there's no way just an agency or two agencies can do this. It should be a national... Uh, um, do a fight that everybody should be involved uh, and I think to a large extent maybe NDLA will have done much better if they have more funds. Uh, I can tell you that they're limited in funds and even in personnel in terms of what they need to do because if you look at what is happening understanding the dynamics that's coming to drug use you see that there was a time it was interdiction when supply needed to be interdicted and then that was done but that had been curtailed a bit then the next issue have been drug, de uh, drug demand reduction, where sensitization, as you said, and also where we make it possible for people to understand and have a, a wide knowledge of substance use. And then people can be deterred from using it, because if there's no uh, demand, supply will dwindle out. What about the stigma? Because, you know, oh, yeah. I know this, the theme this year is Health for Justice, Justice, Justice for, for Health, Health, and they've talked about people not coming forward because of yeah. the stigma. Hardly would anybody come up, because... Let, let me tell you, for instance, I'll give you a, par a particular example. There was a lady that came to this program, and in my foolishness or ignorance, I took her with me to television, and so she went to speak about it. Unfortunately for her, the family of the person she was going to get married to saw her and said, ah, we saw the lady, your son, one of that broke it up. So she never got married. The guy wanted to, but he couldn't. So I learned from that that, look, we are not in a situation, we are not ripe enough when you can expose people like that. But that should be a major plank in which the government should be involved to destigmatize it, and then people can come out just like HIV AIDS, and then they can get help. So for parents and, or caregivers who are mm. watching tonight, I mean, when someone you know, is fully addicted, you can see the signs. Oh, yes. What are those initial signs that a parent or a caregiver should look at to say, there's something I need to investigate here? If parents or caregivers have been very observant, keenly observant of their children or people under their care, they will notice. For instance, when you see a young man begin to wear dark glasses. Yeah, but teenagers all, all wear dark glasses. Should they wear dark glasses inside the house? Okay. That's what I mean, in enclosed spaces. Why should they wear dark glasses? Mm -hmm. Or when the eyes seem to be streaming as if it's running? Or when the eyes are reddish? Or when you see someone dabbing his nose every time with handkerchiefs? or when you see someone who's been doing well in school and suddenly the grades begin to drop or his style of dressing begins to change and his friends change like he changes his handkerchief and then also you notice that a particular time he goes out and he comes back late when suddenly his attitude changes and he begins to be a bit rude or recalcitrant and he even gets violent even with his siblings then you must begin to understand that there's something wrong. And finally, just to quickly throw in there, I mean, we had the whole codeine and oh, yeah. tramadol experience. How far has that gone? Is that still a, a problem? Major. Easy access. Major. You see, there's something that is funny. No, no not funny, but uh, that is the way we deal with the issues in Nigeria. We is like cutting the head and not dealing with the fundamentals. I think that the ban on, cocaine, uh, on codeine and tramadol were hasty. They, 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 it was a rather hasty decision. We needed to understand it. I can tell you today, before codeine was banned, it, you probably would get a bottle for less than a thousand naira. But today you can get codeine, if you know where to get it, between 5,000 and 10,000 naira. And so what has it done is push the business under the table, under the radar, and then people can still indulge in it. Same thing with Tramudol. All right, Director General of the Christ Against Drug Abuse Ministry, Dr. Dokwa Dedeji. Thank you for enlightening us on the news. Thank you very much. In part two, after the break, Army kills 61 suspected armed bandits, arrests others in separate operations in Kaduna, Kano, and Niger states. That's in a moment. Please stay with us.